God bless you, everybody. Happy Resurrection Sunday. This is Pastor Mike, and uh, it is a blessing to be back in the house of the Lord, although virtually for our second Easter Sunday in a row, we are indeed still celebrating the resurrection of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ on this, the highest holy day in our Christian tradition. Uh, we know indeed that uh, the resurrection of Jesus keeps reminding us that we have the power uh, to transcend and overcome our worst conditions, uh, knowing that victory is within our grasp. So as we turn our attention to the biblical text, we are going to come from our lectionary passages of the day. These passages indeed uh, have been set aside by the global church. Uh, to help us all in a uh, unified and coordinated manner uh, think and reflect on the literal implications of a resurrected Savior, which in turn leads to a resurrected people. Amen. And so uh, we're going to come from two passages of Scripture, the Gospel of Luke, chapter number 24, and then we're going to go to... Uh, the letter of Paul to the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter number 15. And uh, I, I want to bring both of these uh, accounts and authors into our resurrection sermon this morning because I do believe they give us uh, both a, a historical record, but also a theological uh, reflection of what resurrection is means, the implications indeed of the resurrected event. And uh, I want you to know, child of God, that as we navigate through these tumultuous times, uh, we may indeed be experiencing uh, real life events that uh, cause us to confront death head on. But there always is a word from the Lord, a theological uh, expression that seeks to give meaning to our struggle. And yes, indeed, there is always meaning to our struggle. There is meaning to our pain. It can be extracted from our worst conditions. Uh, not to suggest that that is the only source of the word from the Lord. God can speak to us without struggle. But how many of you know that there are indeed, as C.S. Lewis says, God whispers to us in our pleasures, but he shouts to us through our pains. Amen. So Luke chapter number 24 uh, is uh, the account of Luke, the uh, comrade and, and doctor, uh, uh, if you will, who took the Pauline account of the gospel and pulled it together for an audience as wide as his scope at the time, uh, really wanted to speak to Jew and Gentile alike, to the Greeks and the Jews and the Romans, trying to help all of these uh, multicultural, uh, multinational audiences understand the universality of the implications of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the ultimate expression of this good news, that is the resurrection of Jesus. Here we go. Luke chapter number 24 records resurrection morning with these words. But on the first day of the week at early dawn, they came to the tomb taking the spices that they had prepared. Talking about the women, the first responders, if you will, uh, the women showing up to the tomb with spices. Verse number two says, and they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body. And while they were perplexed about this, suddenly two men in dazzling clothes stood beside them. The women were terrified, bowed their faces to the ground. But the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? Jesus is not here, but has risen. Verse number six. Remember how Jesus told you while he was still in Galilee that the son of man must be handed over to sinners and be crucified. And on the third day, rise again. Then they remembered Jesus words and returning from the tomb. They told all this to the eleven and to all the rest. Now it was Mary Magdalene, it was Joanna, and it was Mary, the mother of Jesus, 
and other women with them who told what they had seen to the apostles. But these words seemed to be an idle tale, and the apostles did not believe them. But Peter got up and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen clothes by themselves. Then Peter went home amazed at what had happened. All right. Turn with me really quickly. First Corinthians chapter number 15. We're going to read a few verses here. Verses number 19. Chapter 15 of First Corinthians verses 19 through 26. The theological implications, if you will, of this historical event. And the biblical text in uh, verse number 19 says, And if for this life only have we hoped in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. But in fact, Christ has raised from the dead the first fruits of those who have died. And for since death came through one human being, the resurrection of the dead has also come through one human being. For all die in Adam, or Adam, if you will, so all will be made alive in Christ. Verse 23, but each in their own order, Christ the firstfruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. Simply to say that Christ has risen first and all of us, who uh, experience the coming or return of the Lord, both in our daily lives and in the ultimate uh, parousia, the uh, second coming of the Lord, we will then experience resurrection. Verse 24, then comes the end. Oh my, some eschatological conversations being injected in here. When Christ hands over the kingdom to God the Father after Christ has destroyed every ruler and every authority and power, for Christ must reign until he puts all his enemies under his feet, and the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Uh, the word of God for us, the people of God, let us say thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. I'm going to preach for a few moments here, uh, remaining uh, simply from the topic, there is life beyond the tomb. Yes, there is life beyond the tombs. Come on, bow your heads with me and let us pray. God, we want to say thank you, Lord. Thank you for the word of God that has been read for us, the people of God. And we ask you to hide this word in our heart on this Resurrection Sunday. Uh, may the anointing of God that makes preaching and teaching easy, may it rest upon me and even the hearers of your word. And we'll thank you, God. In advance, in Jesus' name we pray that the people of the Lord say amen and amen. There is life beyond the tombs. Now, if the birth of Christ is the fulfillment of God's promise to humanity and the death on the cross was the path by which Christ took in order to wrought our salvation... I want you to appreciate that the resurrection of Jesus is the guarantee of our eventual victory. Because if all Christ has to offer us is a spectacular birth, a exemplary life, a life of organizing and revolutionary activity, or even a martyr's life, if you will, if that is the totality of Christ's offering as a human being on this planet, he is not very different from the many other compelling prophets and figures that have made their sojourn through history's time. But I want you and I to appreciate on this high holy day, we ought to create space in our imagination, certainly in our sanctified imagination, our spirit, our, our, our mind, that there is more to Jesus than meets the eye. That there is more to the life that Jesus lived than the flattened, uh, domesticated Jesus that 
So many of us seek to paint in our own image rather than leaning into the uh, transcendent nature of the uncreated one. That Jesus, if he indeed rose from the dead, as the scriptures tell us, it becomes paradigmatic, if you will, for every believer to experience a similar transcendent supernatural reality and experience in our historical and human life. That Jesus resurrection did not stop with Jesus any more than the incarnation stopped with Jesus. But indeed, the incarnation keeps happening. The idea that God continues to make God's self enfleshed within creation. It keeps happening. God keeps showing up in our lives. And because God keeps showing up in our lives, then resurrection cannot help but happen in our lives as well. And this is the beauty of resurrection, child of God. The beauty of resurrection is that we have a life insurance policy that you and I will never experience an expiration date for. Yes, you have a life insurance policy that is a result of the life and the experience of God's power being unleashed on the deadness of Jesus' experience on the cross. And when you give your life to Christ, part of that association with Jesus guarantees that you will and you must experience your own resurrection of sorts. Now, because of the presence of sin, the rebellious nature of creation against the creator, there are varied forms of resurrection that must visit our lives. You know, I, I, I'm always reminded during resurrection season of the, the, the admonition told to me by a mentor as I was beginning the work of justice and, and mercy ministries as a young preacher. He said to me, you know, Michael, there are many ways for a person to die without taking their physical life. Which is to say that death has become quite the frequent commodity in many people's lives. And if we have uh, not seen the evidence of that, certainly we can attest to this reality over the last year. I can remember at this time last year when we were preaching the, 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 the Resurrection Sunday sermon, at that time, we had experienced 20,000 deaths uh, over that literally month time since we had shut down our church, if you will. All across the country, Corona had taken about 20,000 individuals' lives, and we were all being led to believe that uh, we had a few months and coronavirus would uh, be under control and it would kind of uh, peter out and here we are a year later still experiencing the devastation of death perfected by empire and the greedy impulses of human rulers. Child of God, I want you to know that even in the midst of all of that death, you and I still have space for resurrection. Because while we experience death, we can also at the same time experience life. While we are overwhelmed with the reality of death, we can still at the same time tap into the guarantee of resurrection. Life will try and brainwash us and overwhelm us with the vestiges of death in our society. But you and I must continue to be reminded that death is not a period. When resurrection shows up, death adds a little tag on the bottom of that period and turns it into a comma, 
<laughs> somebody, somebody say, I'm so glad my life insurance turns my death field situations into a comma. Death does not have to have the final say. Death is not the period in our lives, but it turns into a comma because resurrection is on the horizon for every child of God. I want you to continue to tell yourself that as we wade through these tumultuous waters, as we wade through the 550,000 deaths, disproportionately black, brown, uh, low resourced individuals in this uh, wealthy economy. I want you to keep telling yourself that death and greed and violence is not the period. It will not win. Because there is the comma that resurrection inserts into every situation that keeps reminding me there is life beyond this death. There is life beyond this tomb. Dare I say there is a new way of living that God invites us to lean into. You ought to put that in the chat and say there's life beyond this tomb, that there is life that is percolating and that is, is waiting for me to catch up to beyond this tomb and I shall reach out and grab it, that I won't be defined by the death-filled circumstances that may surround me, but even while death is at work in us, Oh, the writer says that life is at work in you. Oh, you ought to say that I feel life at work in me. Now, if there are things that I've learned this year, one of the first things that I, I, I want to lift up to us, if there is life beyond the tombs, I want to make a few distinctions for us that human beings create the conditions for tombs while God initiates the process for resurrection. Human beings create the circumstances that require tombs, but God initiates the conditions where resurrection can happen. If we look in the story, we find that uh, in the book of Luke and certainly in all the other gospels, the story of Jesus' journey to resurrection morning could not have happened without the human construction of death penalty uh, mechanisms, the crucifixion, if you will, the executors, the judges, the juries, the individuals of the state who have mastered how to use power to harm. Humans create the conditions that make tombs necessary. Without a crucifixion, you don't need a burial place. Uh, humans create the conditions whereby we experience empire. Do you not know that the function of a well-structured social society is the caretaking of all, not the few? But when we forget our human responsibility to one another, we create empires rather than well-ordered social society. Uh, humans create hierarchies where God has clearly given us blueprints for uh, society and social relationships that need not use or depend on hierarchies in order to find human meaning. Humans create exploitation that enforce scarcity. Humans master the art of death. And yet in the midst of all of these human constructed Tombs, if you will. God moves. God moves in the midst of tombs and the conditions that create tombs to create circumstances for resurrection. I want you to look at this story and just think about this. They built the tomb and the stone that was rolled in front to block the path. But God created the condition, and dare I say the angels, the mechanism for the stone to be rolled away. They create the, the, the concreteness of systemic and structural evil, but God creates miracles, signs, and wonders to help expand 
the, the imagination of what can be possible as we point our attention to God. Humans create the our hierarchies, but God levels the field. Oh, as we come to the table of communion or the waters of baptism, God knows how to take the hierarchies out and say that all must come the same way. Oh, humans create exploitation, but God reminds us that there is abundance. You see, child of God, what I'm trying to help you and I appreciate is the way we experience life beyond the tomb is to lean into the ways in which God pulls us into the opportunities and realities for resurrection to happen even among death-filled situations. So the first thing that I want to lift up to you as the scripture reminds us in verses 15 and 9, chapter 15, verse 19 in 1 Corinthians, where the scripture says that for in this life, we have only hope for Christ. In this life, we are of all people most miserable. The first teaching point, if you will, that I want you to take away from this is tombs are too shallow to hold you or the resurrecting possibilities of your life. Come on, say that with me. Tombs are too shallow to hold me or the resurrecting possibilities of my new life. I refuse to live life in the grips of death and tombs when our legacies are not to be pitied or shamed. Indeed, child of God, the theological implication of this truth is this, that because resurrection is real, we do not have to allow our faith to only be seen as beneficial in this life. But indeed, it stretches the possibility of what our experiences, the, the real time-bound experiences we must endure, that God knows how to bring us to a place beyond the shallowness of our tombs. Too many of us allow tombs to, to dictate and to define our lives. The conditions that create the tombs, we allow them too much centrality and too much influence and too much determination. I hear God saying to some of us on Resurrection Sunday that we must learn to release whatever circumstances that produce tombs in our life because tombs are not deep enough to hold your impending resurrection. Some of us got to learn to let some of these things go. Why? Because it's just not that deep. Somebody, somebody ought to just put that in the chat. It's not that deep. Whatever it is that is causing my death tomb-like experience, it is not deep deep enough for me to stay in this space. It's not deep enough for me to stay in this place. It is not deep enough for me to stay here. Why? Because the tomb can't hold the resurrected possibilities that are breaking into our lives. I mean, I, 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 I preached about this a, a couple times before, but I always remember that the tomb is the expression of that which holds what life could no longer bear. Amen. That you don't put living things in tombs. You don't put sustained things in tombs. The things that go into tombs are the things that have been exhausted of life. And so if indeed the tomb is holding a part of us, we must realize that perhaps that thing must remain if we are going to experience a new resurrection. And while it's painful to leave some of these things in the tomb, I want you to know, child of God, that that, that tomb is too small for you. That tomb is too shallow for you. Those grave clothes that you, that you wore into that tomb can't hold the new you. 
And God is trying to get some of us to understand that there's something more on the other side of that rolled away stone. There's something more for us on the other side of all of these uh, conditions that create these tombs. That as a matter of fact, God wants you and I, even as we are emerging out of this season of coronavirus and, and of the Trump era and of the, the rise of white nationalism, the rise of Asian xenophobia, of the rise of, of economic exploitation, all of these realities that continue to persist and continue to, to weigh down on us. I want you to know that God is still inviting you out of these death-filled places. And God is saying, who is willing to go beyond the, the, the opening of the tomb? I've rolled away some stones. I dare you to think about uh, in your life the stones that God has rolled away. I want you to think about how many of us were put in a tomb by somebody else and we thought that we were limited to that tomb and we could not get out of that situation. It reminds me of the old hymn that says I was sinking deep in sin and I was sinking to rise no more. I was deeply stained within but the master of the sea Heard my despair crying from the waters. He lifted me now safe and I love lifted me. And that same love that lifts us from these tomb dead like situations are, are the, the forces and the power through the spirit that rolls the stones away. I find it compelling that Mary and, and, and Mary Magdalene and Joanna and, and all the women in the story who showed up to anoint the body of Jesus per their custom, were met with messengers from God, angels from God. They had their own epiphany at the tomb. And what the epiphany at the tomb taught them is that man can put you in a tomb, but God can take you out of the tomb. Lord, help me in here today. I want you to know that there's a lesson even in your tomb, child of God, that man and, and, and people and circumstances may put us in tomb-like situations, bad theology and abuse and depression, uh, exploitation, all of the vices of this world may put us in a tomb, but I'm here to tell you that that tomb need not be your final resting place, uh, but God says, I will always always send somebody. I will always send some power. I will always send a messenger to roll the stone away so you can have life beyond the tomb. And it is that life beyond the tomb that resurrection invites you and I to lean into. Because as we reimagine this new way of life, child of God, I want you to keep telling yourself that just like God has the power to raise me from the dead, God has the power to help me live this new life with a different kind of trajectory. Yes, there is a persistent eschatological hope that is produced by resurrection. Uh, understand when we say eschatology, we're talking about the theology of the end times. Uh, the theology of God wrapping everything up according to God's will. Uh, you got to understand, child of God, that God will not allow loose ends to persist in your life. Uh, that sometimes resurrection is a reminder that God will take every loose end and bring it to a place of blessing. Uh, some of us I know may struggle with this truth. Uh, I know I'm in the middle of some struggle with this truth, God. How will you take the loose ends of my life and how will you bring it all together so you can still get some glory well I appreciate how in our culture this sensibility of the, the result being good of good winning out of evil not being able to have the final say. I can remember when I was watching uh, 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 The Avengers uh, and I was uh, at the movie for The Infinity Wars uh, and I had no idea that at the end of that Avengers movie when Thanos snapped his finger that it was going to create an ending to the movie that left 
all of us feeling less than satisfied. We experienced a level of loss in that movie yeah, where folk left out upset and crying and, and, and saying this cannot be the way the story ends. Uh, uh, you know, I, I remember that experience because I had some loss. Uh, I had some struggle. Uh, and I had to tell myself this can't be the way this story ends. Uh, have you ever had to tell yourself that this will not be the way my story ends. Uh, I know I had to attend that funeral and that memorial, but this will not be the way this story ends. Uh, I know I may have lost my job and some semblance of my health. Uh, my family's been going through. My economic situation is funny, but this will not be the way the story ends. Uh, why? Because God promises us uh, that life will always win out. Uh, you ought to just say that to yourself on Resurrection Sunday. Uh, that life will always win out. Uh, life will find a way. Uh, love will find a way. Uh, peace will find a way. Uh, joy and, and justice uh, and God's will will find a way. Uh, and that's why I love the, the prophetic text uh, that was also in this lectionary this year. Uh, because when you read Isaiah chapter 65 uh, verses 17 through 25 it gives you and I a concrete prophetic vision of what resurrection looks like. It gives you and I a beautiful portrait of an eschatological hope. Uh, for we who are looking for life beyond the tombs. Uh, uh, I, I, I'm going to read a few of these verses because uh, I think some of us need to allow resurrection uh, to unleash a prophetic uh, resurrection utterance from us. Uh, Isaiah 65 verse 17 says, uh, For I am about to create new heavens and a new earth. Uh, the former things shall not be remembered or come to mind. Uh, but be glad and rejoice. Rejoice forever in what I am creating. For I am about to create Jerusalem as a joy and its people as a delight. I will rejoice in Jerusalem. And I will delight in my people. No more shall the sound of weeping be heard in it or the cry of distress. No more shall there be in it an infant that lives but a few days or an old person who does not live out a lifetime. For one dies at a hundred years will be considered a youth. And one who falls short of a hundred will be considered accursed. And they shall build houses and inhabit them. Uh, they shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. Uh, they shall not build and another inhabit. Uh, uh, somebody holler, gentrifiers ain't going to have no place uh, uh, in the prophetic resurrected imagination. Uh, they shall not plant and another eat. Uh, for like the days of a tree shall the days of my people be and my chosen shall long enjoy the work of their hands. Uh, before they call, I will answer. Lord, have mercy. While they are yet speaking, I will hear. The wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. Oh, they shall not hurt or destroy on all my holy mountains, says the Lord. Oh, I want you to know one of my favorite books that I've ever read was Dr. Cornell West called Prophesied Deliverance. Oh, in this season of life, I believe God is trying to raise up a church that's willing to prophesy resurrection. God wants you to use your gifts in this season to make a compelling description of the life beyond the tomb that you must inhabit. God wants some of us to not allow what is happening right now to dim our imagination, but God is saying, come on, child of God, prophesy resurrection. Use a song and prophesy resurrection. Uh, write a poem or make some art that prophesies resurrection. Uh, what kind of dissertation can you produce that 
prophesies that describes a new reality? What kind of family can you sustain that prophesies resurrection? What kind of ministry can you serve that prophesies resurrection? What kind of business can you launch? What kind of justice can you advocate for? What kind of testimony can you tell that prophesies resurrection? Because in the prophesying, in the boldly proclaiming, with your words and your skills and your heart, I believe we can create life beyond the tomb through the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. Oh, child of God, I want you to know that just like Peter came to the tomb and he looked around and he realized something has happened here that has left me amazed. You and I can experience that same holy wonder that I may be experiencing tombs in this season. Oh, but there is life beyond the tomb. There is resurrection beyond this death and on this resurrection Sunday it's up to us now to make it clear and make it concrete that God has never allowed death to win for as the writer proclaimed and the last thing that shall be defeated will be death there is life after the tomb. And I want you, child of God, to appreciate on this Resurrection Sunday that while we are enduring the prayerfully final throes of all of these intersecting pandemics, while the eschatological hope is continuing to break into our lives, while God is continuing to remind us that this will not be the end of my story, of our story, of your story. While we are navigating through all of these circumstances, keep reminding yourself that because of resurrection, there is life beyond tombs. There's a song that says, because he lives beyond the tombs. There is life beyond death situations, deadness. There is life beyond the gloom and the sadness and the struggle. And in the midst of these spaces where we experience real struggle and pain, remind us that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, the same spirit that has been at work in the resurrecting event of scripture of our tradition of the world is still at work among us bring us to a place of life bring us to a place of hope and possibility and make it real in Jesus name for every person under the sound of my voice who has not yet made a decision to follow the ways of Jesus, I want to invite you on this Easter Sunday that there's life even beyond your unbelief, your doubt, your experiences of disappointment with God, with faith, with organized religion, with preachers and pastors and church people. There's life beyond all of that because resurrection 
has never been dependent on the perfection of human beings. It has always been an outgrowth of the divine power of God. And how many of you know that power is real? Oh, I know we got some folk in in this congregation, in this in this space that can testify that it is real. And so I want to invite you to come and experience life beyond the tomb. Some of us continuing to endure the hardest transitions, the hardest circumstances. There's life beyond these realities. Come and let's experience resurrection. Some of us are are coming through these trials and, 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 and we've been by the tomb and we can see the stone rolling away and we can see the breaking of day. God's inviting you to come out of that tomb but come out prophesying resurrection. Come out using your story, your skills, your gifts to paint, to build, to recover, to reimagine, to reclaim resurrection because it is in this way that life beyond the tombs become a reality for us all. Happy Resurrection Sunday. Happy Easter. We love you with the love of the Lord. There's life beyond the tomb.